So last but certainly not least, our final speaker of the day. In my second time introducing this individual, Jim Clerken, the first time I introduced him, it didn't go so well. I, I announced that he had been swimming in the alcohol business for 25 years, and not the best way to introduce him. Certainly did not do it justice. I promised I would do it better the second time. As, as I mentioned, Jim Clerken is the CEO of Moet Hennessy USA. Jim is a friend of the organization, and we're honored delighted to have him here today. He has over 30 years of experience in the wine and spirits industry. Over his career, Jim has worked for a number of the most prestigious and successful companies in the industry, including the company we all might know, Guinness, Gilby's, Diageo, Pernard Ricard, Beam Global. In 2008, he was recruited to the iconic brand of Moet Hennessy, the Wine and Spirits Division of LVMH, where he was appointed CEO in 2010. He is also the Vice Chairman of the Distilled Spirits Council of America. And outside of work, he is the Chairman of Cooperation Ireland and the U.S., which is a non-for-profit organization that, that focuses on promoting peace and reconciliation. Born in County Down, Jim now lives in Westport, Connecticut, with his wife Jenny and their four children, Rachel, James, Jennifer, and Luke. Please give our closing speaker of the day a warm round of applause, Mr. Jim Clerken. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, I'm absolutely delighted to get a chance to come along and speak to you, but frankly, um, I'm somewhat humbled to be on the same stage as Mark, uh, fellow Ulster man, uh, just an extraordinary story. I was a, a somewhat failed marathon runner myself, and I know what it is to try and get through the last 285 yards of every 26 miles you do, and uh, I feel somewhat emotional about listening to that wonderful story, and worrying about my numbers and worrying about my budget suddenly means nothing to me anymore. It's an honor to be in the same room as you, Mark. So uh, the chairman of the Irish International Business Conference called me and said, Jim, would you mind coming along and uh, make sure that you say some words before we all rush off to Fitzpatrick's? And I said, okay, I'll, I'll probably do an hour or so. And, uh, <laughs> I decided when it was Fitzpatrick's, and I normally get thirsty around 5 p.m. myself, that I would cut it down to 30 minutes. But after hearing Mark, you're just going to have to suffer 15 minutes, I promise you. Um, well, uh, I said, well, I'll talk about Mark. He said, well, yourself. You're pretty good at talking about yourself. And he's right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. And then I'm going to link a little bit into Mark's, uh, sorry, Sean's opening remarks this morning about connections, because listen to Mark and all his connections, all the connections in this room, uh, you will see how connections played out uh, a role for me in my life. This is where it started, this is Rostrever, this is the foot of the Morn Mountains, uh, about 50 miles south of where Mark grew up. Uh, we're looking over here at Carningford Lock, and you will see in a moment through that little obelisk or monument sticking up, I'll explain a bit more about that. Uh, and this is where I grew up, and that's the village square, the village pub to the right, that's my brother's, uh, Luke. Uh, he still owns it and uh, runs it. We have a small farm there. And it was really expected uh, that with the small farm we had that I would one day go back and, and, and run that farm. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So here's your first Q&A. The obelisk is a little bit uh, enlarged. Does anybody know why that is in Ross Trevor? Probably not. But if I tell you it was built in honor of a guy called Colonel Ross, does that mean anything? Colonel Ross met a lady called Trevor, and Colonel Ross was given a lot of land by the King of England, who uh, felt that he was a great soldier. There's a big clue for you. And he said to Colonel Ross, all the land before you, you own. So Colonel Ross took it all and married Lady Trevor and named it Ross Trevor. Well, the reasons that's there, not to boast about, because I became a citizen of this great country seven years ago, Colonel Ross burned down the first White House. Yes, he did. I promise he did. So I was all set to go to the farm, and uh, that all changed when I was very fortunate to get invited 
into uh, a Guinness program called the Young Executive Development Program. And it was at Guinness where I met my mentor, my coach, and the guy who really taught me about connections, John Larry. That's John to your extreme left with a white hair. Unfortunately, he passed away two years after this with malignant melanoma on all things on his foot, on the sole of his foot, which is hard to believe. The young guy with the black hair beside him, that's what 30 years in the business does to you, folks. <laughs> that's what it does to you. <laughs> no doubt about it, but it was a great time. And upon reflection, and I was thinking about this as my son scanned this photograph for me yesterday, uh, I wouldn't be here today. There's no chance I would be here today speaking to you about some of the great opportunities that have been presented to me if it wasn't for that man, John Lavery. And I want to say now, John, he's gone, but I want to say, John, thank you. So John and I paraded through the streets of Dublin, Belfast, and all over Ireland with Guinness. I spent 18 fantastic years there. Guinness in those days is not like today. I'm not going to say anything negative, but it was a family, literally, genuinely, a, a real family. And Lord Ivey was the head of that family, and we knew them all, and we all had free medicine, we had free food, we had free pints, not too shabby. And, uh, and I was given a fantastic opportunity, and this is something that I want to uh, really relate to you business entrepreneurs and owners and people who have the, the good fortune to recruit, because in this company, I started off in the botting hall uh, during this young executive development program. They put me into sales, finance, marketing, production, and basically they turned me into what I am today, which is not very much, I suppose, but I'm a generalist, so I know a little bit about everything, and it was fantastic training. And I think when you recruit young people, please try and f find time, especially in their induction, to bring them through uh, all the aspects of the business, give them a rounding so they know what's going on, not just stick them into whatever it is they're meant to do. Now, after those 18 years, though, I, I guess I was hoping to go further, and I got a knock on the door, and a company called Gilby's, which is part of the Grand Metropolitan Group, asked me to join them as a managing director, and who wouldn't want to be a managing director of the largest wine and spirit company in Ireland? So I headed down to Dublin in 1994, and I took the chair of a legend uh, in the industry, a gentleman who also needs reminded, or we should be reminded of, David Dand. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of David Dand, but there's probably 5,000 people who claim that they created Bailey's. David Dand created Bailey's. And I was so fortunate to take his chair and even more fortunate when I read through all his files, he spent five years trying to get Bailey's Irish Cream up to 5,000 cases. His great friend Peter Malone of the Jury's Hotel Group in Dublin got him his first 1,000 cases by putting it into cakes because he couldn't sell it in the bar, so he turned it into a dessert. Uh, totally true. Today, Bailey's is 8 million cases. So David Dan really was onto something. Now, Gilby's was part of Grand Metropolitan, and this is where all starts getting confusing because in 1998... Grand Metropolitan merged with Guinness, so there I was back with all my old buddies again, and I took over the Diageo business in Ireland in 1998, and I stayed there until 2000, and I uh, became the chairman of the Wine and Spirit Association. I built myself a little cottage in Carlingford County Louth, which we'll talk about later, and I said to myself, well, life was good. Then I got a call to London, and my boss says, Jim, you have to move. Go west, young man. You don't have enough international experience. And before I knew where we were, my wife and youngest son, Luke, were off to California and into San Francisco, where we had a fantastic time. And I took over a business uh, which scared the hell out of me, I don't mind telling you. It was 18 states, $1.9 billion of revenues, and 17 million cases of spirits. So uh, from a kid growing up in Strever, I suddenly thought, what the heck am I going to do with this? But the other piece of good advice my dad gave me, of course, was, I don't know how good you are, son. And I remember him saying to me, Mark, when I finished the Dublin Marathon in 1982, well, how'd it go, son? I said, well, not too bad. Uh, you know, uh, I think I did okay. Well, what position did you come? I said, well, I don't know, Dad, but it was two hours, 59 minutes and four seconds. No, 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 what position did you come? Well, 656. Oh, you may give that up, he said. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I said, but Dad, there was 11,000 people behind me. Doesn't matter a shit, he said, give it up. Um, so I might have stayed in California if it wasn't for the fact that uh, I got a call from another British conglomerate called Ally Demek. Most of you probably do not know Ally Demek. They were brewers, uh, wines and spirits. They did become the second largest in the world. And that's why I moved to Westport, Connecticut. That's indeed 
uh, where they were based. Uh, can you believe it? But uh, that's where we moved to in uh, 19, no, sorry, 2003. And uh, this was a fabulous opportunity for me because for the first time, I got an opportunity to manage a business, not in one country, but three. So I had the privilege of taking over the business for Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And it was a fabulous business. We grew it very fast. I was very lucky with some great people. The greatest thrill that I can take out of my time with Ali Demek, every single one of my direct reports today are managing directors of other companies. My chief financial officer is the chief executive officer of Perna Recar in China. My chief marketing officer is the uh, managing director, chief executive of Grants. Uh, and so I'm really pleased about that. The numbers don't really mean much. If you get the right people in the right jobs, the money and the cases and the volume will all come. So we did so well uh, that the competition thought, this isn't looking good, so they bought us. And in 2005, Perna Recar did a joint venture with a company called Jim Beam, and they bought us for 14 billion pounds. And uh, before I knew where I was, I was off to Deerfield, Illinois, where I worked for Jim Beam. Again, I had uh, a wonderful privilege of managing Jim Beam. It was just a great thrill to manage an American company with an American brand for Canada, Mexico, and, and the US. And I was sad that my father and my mother had passed away by that time, because I know it would have made them pretty proud. They had great brands like Canadian Club, Size of Tequila, you might know Maker's Mark with a red cap, and, uh, and of course the flagship Jim Beam. When I talk about connections in a moment or two, the next one actually is a very interesting connection because I got a phone call from a guy called Christophe Navarre. Christophe Navarre is my current boss. I met him in 2000. And uh, he convinced me to leave and join Moat Hennessy to run the business here out of, based out of New York. Uh, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about uh, LVMH and Moat Hennessy. LVMH, as you know, is Louis Vuitton, Moat Hennessy, and very involved in luxury goods, watches, fashion, fragrances. And the piece of business that I have is all the wine, champagne, and, and spirits. I'm pleased to tell you that after a couple of tough years, uh, the day that the banks uh, started announcing really bad results in 2008 and 2009, uh, my business dropped $100 million of profit in a single year. That was profit, not revenue, by the way. Uh, everybody stopped drinking champagne. And even those who could afford it, and a lot of people could, couldn't be seen to be drinking it in public. So it was pretty much a crisis, but uh, I'm glad to tell you, we'll fast forward, we're now the fastest growing wine and spirit company in America. We'll do $2 billion this year, and uh, we've, beat, we've beaten our budget substantially over the last three or four years. And I see Maria here, one of my uh, interns, who's helped me do that. Thanks, Maria. When I looked at the agenda I, and I saw Sean's opening remarks were about connections, I thought I'd start talking a little bit about connections. And uh, I'm going to start talking about connections with our wholesalers. In America, as a consequence of the repeal of prohibition in 1933, after the failed experiment, did you know, by the way, here's an Irish story for you, did you know that between 1921 and 1933 we had prohibition, which meant that alcohol of all sorts was completely banned in America? Well, did you know that during those years we saw more booze in the history of all America? There was more alcohol consumed during the time you weren't allowed to drink it. So what does that tell you? Uh, if, if, if you? If you want to sell that, tell people they can't get it. Uh, it, it is true in luxury, that's for sure. Uh, but we have some very large wholesalers. Every single wholesaler in the United States is family-owned. Hard to believe, but it's true. All family-owned. Some of them came out of that era, by the way and legitimized their businesses and became very successful. Our largest wholesaler is based in Miami, a father and a son uh, business called Southern Wines and Spirits. And this year, their revenues will be 11 billion, and that's billion with a B, just a family-owned business. And uh, the way they operate is all about connections. Uh, they have connections with uh, the authorities, the politicians, they have an enormous lobby because we're self-regulated. We regulate our own industry. Uh, they have connections with every magazine owner. They have connections with all the big football stars. They have connections with all the VIPs. And they never lose a connection. 
uh, they're very involved in making sure that it all comes together because they all know that if these people develop and grow, get into power, those connections will come back to support you at some time in the future. And they do pay off, I promise you. A couple of the connections that really matter to me. Top left-hand side, that's Christoph Navarre. That's my boss. I met him in 2000. He and I got on extremely well. I was a competitor at his, and he kept in touch. So much so, he called me in 2008, and now I work for him. So much so, not only do I run the business for him in the United States, which is, I told you, about $2 billion, but he put me on as global executive. Now, there was a connection I could have just let go, or he could have let go, but that connection has brought me to this uh, table today. The gentleman in the middle, the top middle, is Larry Ruvo. He's our wholesaler distributor in Nevada. Uh, Larry built a hospital uh, through fundraising. I helped him fundraise. I have a little cottage, as I mentioned, in Carningford. I put it up for auction one night. Steve Wynn, who owns all those great casinos down there, paid $250,000. And you want to see the place he got for $250,000. Uh, but he did pay $250,000, and they raised $23 million. It was the largest single uh, fundraising night ever in the United States so far. And the hospital's built. It's called the Lou Ruvo Institute. Uh, it was designed by Frank Geary, the astonishing uh, uh, architect. And uh, Larry said to me, by the way, when you're moving to the United States, when you're moving to New York, you've got to know a few people there, Jim. It's a tough, tough, tough city when you're doing business. I'm going to make a phone call for you. I'm going to call, Mar call Marvin Schenken. Does anybody smoke cigars or drink wine? That's Marvin Schenken on the top right-hand side. And he set up lunch for me the first week I was here. I met Marvin. Marvin has been astonishingly helpful to me. He took me under his wing when I came to New York. He writes astonishingly good reports for all our wines and champagnes. We just got 98 points in Wine Spectator. I'm sure that's a big coincidence, um, uh, which helps enormously in terms of our pricing and our volumes. And he said to me, by the way, I want you to meet the best wholesaler in New York. The best wholesaler in New York is the bottom left. That's Charlie Marinoff. He owns a company here in New York called Charmer Sunbelt. He's small, by the way. He only did $5.7 billion uh, last year. But Charlie uh, came along to some of my events with Corporation Ireland, and he said, you know, I'm really interested in what you're doing, and this is great about young people trying to get them off the streets, the youth leadership program, etc., etc. Is there any way I can help? And I said, well, you're helping, Charlie, by just coming along. And the next day he sent me an envelope by Federal Express and opened it up and he sent me $250,000 for Cooperation Ireland. That was a pretty good connection, right? And the guy on the bottom right, that's Wayne Chaplin. He owns Southern Wines and Spirits. I met his father in uh, California in 2000. His father introduced me to his son, Wayne. Wayne now looks after uh, $1.2 billion of our $1.9 billion in America. He's our wholesaler. So I thought those were pretty good connections that worked for me and probably should give you an example of why connections in this room are also very important. Switching gears a little, uh, but sticking with connections. Uh, I am the chairman, I'm proud to tell you, of Cooperation Ireland in America. I was the chairman in Ireland when I lived there. I believe in it passionately. Um, and it's all about promoting a lasting peace. We have peace, thank goodness. Everybody knows we have peace in Ireland now after three decades of, of horror. But it's fragile and we need to keep working at it. And the way to make sure we have a sustained peace is to get reconciliation. And, and in my opinion, working with young kids in Belfast, Dublin, Limerick, Cork, all over Ireland, Derry City, reconciliation is difficult. Uh, how do you forgive someone who, who maimed or murdered your brother or your cousin or your uncle? It's, it's, it, you have to forgive. And the great Nelson Mandela showed us how to do that, but it was difficult. We let a lot of people out of jail in Belfast who had murdered, uh, but we had to do it to move forward. So my ambition with Cooperation Ireland is a strange one. My ambition is to close it down. And you might say, why would you do that? You have two astonishing patrons, Her Majesty the Queen of England, His Excellency the President of Ireland, or our patrons. The only, we are the only charity in the world that they support this way. But the reason I want to shut it down after 35 years is if we shut it down, that means something. It means we're not needed. Now, unfortunately, I think we're going to be around for a few more years. Right? We still have a little bit of reconciliation to do. But we have a number of fantastic programs 
Uh, and I think the best one that Sean's familiar with is the youth leadership program. So if you ever get a chance to help this youth leadership program where we take kids, peer group leaders from various districts, some of the toughest areas in Belfast and Derry and Cork and Limerick, and we ask them to lead uh, an event or an activity, it could be a soccer tournament, it could be a, a, an arts tournament, it could be a, a musical event, and to get people occupied. And, and of course, through this, we also work with education. And the thing that's really going to make a lasting peace sustainable with reconciliation is integrated education in Northern Ireland and, of course, great jobs. We'll talk about jobs in a moment. Uh, one of the things that I try to do is, is also working with education. We bring uh, an intern every year from Belfast, from Northern Ireland, from one of the universities there. Maria is the fine example we have this year. Maria has been working very hard all year, making Maud and Sean Don become greater than it is. Uh, and it's such a great program because not only do they work on brands like Belvedere Vodka, uh, Dom Perignon, uh, Glen Marangi, Maud and Sean Don, and they, they are unbelievable representatives of the province of Ulster. But the great news is, and I know you will do it, Maria, when they go back, the connections are fantastic, when they go back home and talk about what they had in America, talk about what they had at Maud and Sean Don, I think is uh, enormously good for everybody. Now, talking about jobs, Sean, you will recall I had the privilege of housing and hosting in our offices down in the Meatpacking District, the former mayor, the former Lord Mayor of Belfast, Martino Mueller. Martino, I know, wanted to be here, but he had an operation uh, last week, I think. Uh, he's such a great guy, and he really, really believes in building Belfast and bringing jobs to Belfast. And uh, I, I think it's so important that all of you in this room, all of the diaspora, in America, try to find ways to bring jobs back to Ireland. Uh, you know, wh what does that do? Well, it materially helps the economy. That's obvious, I suppose. But it gets our highly educated and very hard working young people gainfully employed. And it supports the environment that I talked about of a lasting peace and reconciliation. So I want to talk a little bit about the diaspora that has been mentioned by Sean. We really must take more time and we all say we're busy, and I am very busy, but we owe it to ourselves to take more time. Uh, we've all gone abroad. We've made the connections here. We've all been relatively successful. But we must do more to find ways to bring work and employment back to, to Ireland. I think at this stage, it would be very remiss of me, because I have been to several of Sean's events, if I didn't pay due credit to the Irish International Business Network. Uh, the events are first class that are run. This is a great example. Uh, I can't believe with all the things you're on, you're almost in time if I get off the stage soon. And you are really making a positive difference. I know we're thirsty folks and so am I. Um, Sean and I have talked about a couple of things that are important to say. We have a lot of organizations. You know, the American Ireland Fund, which is magnificent, used to compete against a little bit my fund, the Corporation Ireland, and we competed against them. I'm delighted to tell you that the host of the hotel we're going to, Paul Fitzpatrick, uh, I went to see him in Dublin uh, and Belfast and in the Titanic Centre three months ago. He gave us a cheque for a million dollars from the American F Ireland Fund into Cooperation Ireland because they've got a lot of money. We've got great programmes on the street. And that's where we need to get these networks working together. And I think it's a quote of Sean's. Really what we need to do is create, create a network of networks. And that's what you can do, and that's what we can do. I do believe that what was announced, I think it was last night, uh, by Minister Dinehan, that the Irish Executive Mentoring Programme, which was relaunched last night, is such a fabulous thing that we really need to work hard on and support each other, connect in the diaspora. But are we really well organized as a diaspora? From the north, I can tell you, I don't think so. I think Minister Denham's done a superb job, and the Irish government have declared how important the diaspora is by making him a minister responsible. And I, I think it's wonderful to see he was here. I'm, I'm, will I see him later? I'm not sure if he'll be able to be here. Good. Because that's showing how important the diaspora is. And I'm so pleased that he relaunched the program for uh, executive mentoring last night. He's also hit the ground running, though, with something else, I think, which is very special. He has expressed his support for an Irish government initiative which will extend the vote in Irish presidential elections to the Irish diaspora, which I think is fantastic, and to Northern Ireland. This is the type of bold action 
that we need, and that's the, the reason I think that Minister Denton is showing great leadership. I also want to acknowledge, though, in Northern Ireland, the Irish Connections Group, headed by Andrew Cowan, and the work of the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister. Of course there's troubles there, of course it's difficult, the talks are going on, but those two people have done an enormous amount of work every time they come to America to spread the good word and building the bridges abroad. Now I accept, and here's my little party political broadcast, that Northern Ireland is probably too small, Mark, to have a minister work full time in this, although it probably should be you. But I truly believe, yes, yes, I truly believe that we need a full-time official head of the Northern Ireland diaspora to work with the Southern Irish diaspora and bring us all together. I therefore call upon this evening for the Northern Ireland executive to consider adding the responsibility for the Northern Ireland diaspora to the portfolio of one of our existing ministers. It doesn't have to be a new job. Add it into one of our existing Who cares? Who cares about the diaspora? I go to all the Irish events around New York and all the Northern Irish guys, all the Ulster guys, I say, well, where's our gang, you know? And we want to be together and we want to help and support. It is more than a statement, I think. This responsibility will include things like the following, helping to arrange meetings, events, trade missions to North America, and of course, trade delegations from the US back to Belfast. This will also give me and all my fellow diaspora friends a platform to rally around. So, what does Ireland have to offer people from America who want to invest? Well, uh, this is Carlingford. This is where the cottage is, up on one of those little hills. And it just sort of, every time I go back, I think, whoa, how beautiful is this place? And I just took a couple of, I mean, I didn't go searching very hard to find photographs. This is Don Luce Castle in Carney Antrim, and behind that is, is the beautiful Royal Port Rush Golf Club. But Ireland has got everything. It's got rivers, valleys, lakes, mountains, countryside. And we probably don't want to talk too much about golf if it hasn't happened already. But talking about golf courses, I just thought I'd put up four of them. Some of the greatest golf courses on earth. This is uh, Port, old Port Marnock just outside Dublin. This is the fabulous Royal Port Rush. And I took Wayne Chaplin. You remember Wayne? the guy with $11 billion, and he said, he stood on this, right on this fairway with me. By the way, I grew up in Ross Trevor, 14 miles from this place, and I never set foot on it until three years ago, and I can't believe how beautiful it is. There's the Morton Mountains, there's the, uh, the hotel owned by Dr. Billy Hastings, and he said to me, you know what this is, Jim? This is Pebble Beach on steroids. And I thought, only an American can say that. <laughs> uh, but I like it, it's quite nice, isn't it? Um, and of course we've got these extraordinary golfers who are also great ambassadors. By the way, Mark, I would love you to be the head of the diaspora. You would be amazing. Um, even these amazing golfers like Darren and Rory and Podrick and, and uh, of course, Graham, who've won nine. Can you imagine? Like, the last British Open was won by Fred Daly from Belfast in 1957, and all of a sudden with nine majors. Extraordinary ambassadors. But then there's other things about Ireland we have to offer. You know, think about, and sometimes we forget about, we have four international airports, including Shannon, of course, Dublin, Cork, and Belfast. We've got seven regional, significant regional airports, including Donegal, Galway, Knock, Sligo, Waterford, Kerry, and the George Best uh, Airport in Belfast. And there's too many seaports. Oh, I should not forget the Great K Club. Um, I thought this was fascinating when I looked at it. You know, okay, we'll, we'll probably only ever talk about Cork and Ross Lair and Dunleary and Dublin and Larne and Belfast. But just look at the number of extraordinary ports we have, which I think gives us a, a, the ability to, to operate in almost any industry. And we have a great railroad. We have a great road system with a world-class motorway. Okay, we're in America, so we'll call it highway, uh, between Dublin and Belfast. And by the way, that road, if any of you have been on there, is like fantastic. You can now make... Within the speed limit, you can make Dublin to Belfast in two hours now. But most importantly, we have a young, well-educated, eager to succeed workforce. They are hungry, I can tell you. They are hungry for success. My young son, James, graduated out of the University of Ulster two years ago, and now he's the accountant in Las Vegas for Bob Arum, uh, top rank, the largest boxing agency in the world. 
these kids, when they get a chance, they really want to work. They're hungry for success, and I can tell you this, with all the experience I have with the interns coming into my company, they will pay you back with big dividends with any opportunity that you offer them. So in conclusion, I thought I would say to you that with a picture of old Belfast looking at the new Belfast, and Mark, this is the new Titanic Quarter, this extraordinary museum which shows growing out of the ashes of Belfast the modern way. I think Ireland is ready. I think the time is now, as you look at old Dublin, and then you look at new Dublin. I hope this conference will be the catalyst for all the Irish diaspora to sign up to the conviction that we can and we will make a positive difference by using our connections in a way that will benefit our home, the Amber Lyle. Thank you.